Clutching at his chest, the man experienced a surge of pain. The lack of funds prevented him from seeking medical assistance, leaving him weakly pawing at his chest and coughing up blood onto the filthy futon below. The physical torment he endured was accompanied by mental anguish and frustration. Reflecting on his past, he had strived to lead an honest life by working, getting married, having a child, and purchasing a house. However, circumstances had taken a turn for the worse. Burdened with debt. Juggling multiple part-time jobs, and denied visitation rights to his daughter, he found himself unjustly accused of an affair and embezzlement. Despite his protests, he lost his job and was constantly harassed by debt collectors. Despair overwhelmed him and he pondered where he had gone astray. The pain and frustration grew, and he yearned for an end to it all. In an unexpected twist, a man wearing a striped tailcoat materialized by his futon, holding a bag. Recalling stories of deceased pets guiding people. He wondered why his own dog hadn't come for him. Struggling to speak due to his condition, the man questioned the guide's true identity. The guide knelt beside him, still shrouded in shadows, and clarified his purpose, and that is to offer a new world rather than the afterlife. He used magic to live broadcast his ex-wife's conversation with her new husband. It was revealed that the wife had pushed all the dead into him. His daughter was also not his biological daughter and as it was only on paper as his so he had to pay the child support. She was claiming that it was the minimum that he had to do for marrying such a waste. He was getting more angry the more he heard them. It was something happening as they spoke. There were certainly some flags, but he thought that he was just overthinking, which led to his current state. Since he had endured such a hard life, the guide decided to intervene to give him another chance. He took out a bunch of cards from inside the bag and showed him which he told him that it was his present. Since he had a miserable life, he wanted his next life to be happy and asked him to choose one of the cards which would be the world he would reincarnate. When he contemplated that, it was also revealed that his boss framed him for his crime. He was such a foolish man and said to the guide that all he wanted was revenge. But the guide can't help him as his flames of life are going to be extinguished. He can only offer him a happy afterlife. Fueled by rage and frustration towards his ex-wife and former boss, the man harbored thoughts of revenge. Regrettably, the guide informed him that his current life was nearing its end, presenting him with a choice for a happier second chance instead. Tearfully, the man pleaded for revenge, but the guide explained that he could only select his next world. Overwhelmed. The man opted for the world featuring humanoid machines and space battleships. The lifespan of the human is also sevenfold longer, which means several folds of fun, but he didn't care about that. He was deceived and made into a laughing stock, but he couldn't even get revenge. If he knew that his life was going to end like this, he would have enjoyed his life more than caring about others. Good people get awarded eventually, but that was just a lie. He wants to live his life freely, stomp on others, and become an evil person. In his new world, the ones who hold powers are nobles. Despite the advancement in civilization, feudalism had made its return. Living an honest life is only for retards, so he decided to live his life as an evil lord. As his consciousness faded, the guide's true intentions came to light. Reveling in the man's suffering, the guide admitted to orchestrating his unhappiness for personal gratification. This malevolent being derived pleasure from others' pain and misery. Laughing maniacally, he disclosed his manipulation of the man's ex-wife and her lover to contribute to his misery. Satisfied with his malevolent actions, the guide decided to end that drama. He manipulated the lover so that he broke up with her. When she blackmailed him, he revealed all her mistakes and also didn't want to take responsibility for the child as it was not his papers anyway. She cried desperately to not abandon her. But he doesn't want to have a life with a cheater. The guide was amusing this whole spectacle. When she was abandoned, she began to think about her late husband. The guide was amused at that as she was the one who was responsible for his death. 
He anticipated what she would do in the future, but no matter what she would still end up living a miserable life. The guide's aim was to witness the man who died before, to curse him in his next life final moments. At that moment, a small light entered the room, gradually taking the form of a dog. It watched as the guide allowed the man to meet an undesired fate. Guiding his soul to a world where humans' lives were easily consumed. The guide relished the anticipation of the man's future despair, fueled by the knowledge that people on earth would eagerly grasp at the idea of reincarnation. With a bit of cunning persuasion, he could deceive anyone. Contemplating how to savor the man's suffering, the guide left through a door, while the dog followed him without his knowledge. And so it happened, just as the guide had promised, the man reincarnated into a noble house. His new name became Liam Sarah Banfield. Fulfilling the guide's pledge, by being born as the son of a count ruling over a planet. Embracing his desire, to become an evil lord, Liam contemplated whether a life of debauchery awaited him. However, that was inconsequential as long as he could live life on his own terms. In the midst of his thoughts, a letter arrived, revealing that the guide had provided him with support. Intrigued, Liam pondered its contents. Soon, his parents entered, congratulating him on his fifth birthday and transferring the title and land to his name as a present. His mother offered to purchase a customizable robomade for him. He was asked to customize it however he wanted. He decided to max all the specs as they were the ones who were going to pay. When he selected the option for sexual desire, his parents commended his refined taste. He wondered if it was the support from the guide. Starting off by removing the parents from the picture and leaving an ideal robomade girl with him who would never betray him. He was thankful to the guide. As the maid was modified instantly, the patents explained that there was another news for him. They were going to live in a mansion in the capital and asked him to sign the documents for their pension. He signed it and was proud of his act of evil and eagerly looked forward to the future. Long ago, the world had been under the rule of artificial intelligence until humanity rose up and established an empire. The new rulers outlawed over-reliance on AI and minimal dependence became the norm. During the journey to the capital, Liam's parents revealed their true nature. They never truly cared for him and merely burdened their failing planet's debts onto their son, ensuring their comfortable life in the capital. Oblivious to this manipulation, Liam took pride in being the lord of his house. Although insignificant beyond his territory, he relished the role of king within his own domain. Brian, his butler, entered and informed him of the arrival of his robomaid. With Liam's permission, the maid entered the room and introduced herself as Amagi. She would now be responsible for taking care of Liam. Surprisingly, Amagi required only two hours of maintenance per week and could be instantly modified. Liam found this amusing and decided to indulge in his desires. He raised his hands as Amagi approached fondling her breasts and marveling at their softness. Ignoring Brian's objections, he ordered him to submit a report on the territory. As Brian presented the digital reports, Liam found himself unable to comprehend the information. If he were to become an evil lord, he needed to understand the outcomes. Amagi, programmed as an advisor, offered her assistance. She suggested that Liam enter the education capsule allowing him to gain knowledge and enhance his body. The process would take six months, during which he would enter a state of hibernation. Brian cautioned against it, citing the Empire's taboo on relying on AI. However, Amagi clarified that it was merely a suggestion and the final decision rested with Liam. The education capsule was a technology that could impart knowledge and strengthen the body of the person inside. Liam decided to seize the opportunity. Acknowledging his weakness and the necessity of learning how to oppress others. He planned to take it slow, relishing the smoothness of AI and embracing the path of an evil lord. In a bar located within Liam's territory, a barkeeper and a customer engaged in a conversation about the recent appointment of the new lord. With Liam's father assuming control of the planet, he used it as an excuse to levy taxes on the people. 
The nobles viewed the commoners no differently than livestock. Hoping that the new lord would bring about positive changes, even if only in small measures. Two years had passed since Liam took over the territory. The previous lord had a unique taste when it came to designing his castle. Brian, Liam's loyal servant, gazed at a portrait of Alistair Sarah Banfield, Liam's great grandfather, with a sense of honor for having served him. Unfortunately, as the new generation took over, things went downhill. They indulged in lavish lifestyles, accumulating debt along the way. They shifted their burdens onto Liam's father and migrated to the capital. Liam's father followed suit. After reminiscing about the past, Brian entered Liam's office. Liam, curious about being locked inside, soon realized the reason for that. The mansion was in a terrible state, and he couldn't fathom who would have designed such an awful structure. To his relief, Brian expressed his own disapproval of the mansion, reassuring Liam that his taste differed from his father's. Determined to start fresh, Liam decided to demolish the castle and build a new one. He also planned to dismiss all the employees currently working there. Amagi, Liam's robomaid, proposed the idea of rehiring the employees after providing them with proper education for their roles in the new castle. She agreed to the demolition as it would reduce operating costs. Aware that constructing a new castle would take time, Liam intended to approach the process meticulously. Brian supported this idea. To plan for the construction costs, Amagi suggested reorganizing the fleet. Currently, they have 30,000 ships, of which only 20% were operational. She proposed reducing the fleet to 3,000 ships to cut expenses. Brian opposed the idea, concerned about how other nobles would perceive them, as well as the potential threat from space pirates. Amagi countered stating that 1,000 ships would suffice to deal with pirates, and the fleet members lacked adequate skills. Determined to eliminate useless subordinates, Liam dismissed the entire fleet. Amagi began making preparations, while Brian cautioned against relying too heavily on AI, as it would invite scrutiny and disdain from the Banfield House's peers. Liam, however, dismissed those concerns, declaring that the name of the house had already been tarnished, and he would gradually increase the fleet over time. He instructed Amagi to create a fleet that befit his stature. Brian, convinced by Liam's decision, couldn't help but be reminded of Alistair's character. With his resolution firm, Liam requested a hug from Amagi and proceeded to engage in his routine of fondling her breasts. Leaving Brian uncertain about how to react to such boldness displayed right in front of him. The more Liam learned about his territory, the more he realized its dire state. It was already in such a dismal condition that he couldn't exploit it further. The inhabitants were worse off than those in his previous world, and it felt as though he was trapped in the Middle Ages. Frustrated, he wondered why his ancestors hadn't developed the territory. Amagi explained that over time, the people would develop the territory on their own and most nobles preferred to let them fend off on their own. Liam questioned if he had been deceived by the guide. Amagi clarified that with proper use of tax money, they could develop the territory within the next 20 years. Considering the short time compared to his lifetime, Liam agreed. Realizing that he needed to invest in the present to reap the benefits in the future. Expressing his desire for personal power rather than solely relying on the fleet, Liam yearned for martial arts skills to stand against violence, unlike his fearful past self who succumbed to debt collectors. He aimed not only to defend himself, but also to overpower others. Amagi attempted to dissuade him, but Liam remained steadfast, instructing her to find the best mentor to guide him. He refused to be a victim, determined to become the one who takes from others. Meanwhile, the guide observed Liam's former wife, who had fallen on hard times and appeared worn out, clad in tattered garments. The guide took pleasure in witnessing numerous individuals suffering and decided to focus on monitoring Liam instead of idling away. Noticing Liam's preference for artificial companions over real women due to his trust issues, the guide saw an opportunity to manipulate him, especially when it discovered Liam's desire for power. 
Determined to assist him, the guide sent an extraordinary talent, Yasushi, to Liam's aid. The guide hoped that Liam would appreciate Yasushi's presence and planned to meet Liam again in a different form at a later stage. At the Banfield spaceport, Yasushi, prepared by the guide, arrived. He wouldn't have accepted a job as an instructor on such a remote planet if not for his debts. Taking advantage of Liam's young age, he found it easy to deceive Liam. He even purchased a katana to flaunt, a rare sight in the present day which shows his ulterior motives. Yasushi met Lord Liam at his residence and introduced himself. He advised Liam not to be overly serious and explained that the ultimate technique of his martial arts style was a lethal one, not to be shown carelessly. Making an exception for Liam, Yasushi requested Amaji to leave, but she refused. Yasushi insisted that he would decline the job if she remained. Observing Yasushi's unwavering demeanor in the face of a lord, Liam sensed his authenticity and expressed his eagerness to learn from him. He ordered Amaji to depart. And she handed him a device capable of detecting any swindlers, before leaving Liam in Yasushi's care. Once Amaji was gone, Yasushi instructed Liam to place the wooden logs wherever his sword couldn't reach. After positioning all the logs, Yasushi assumed a stance. He prepared to demonstrate the flash technique, a move akin to magic. Yasushi drew his sword lightly and returned it to its sheath. Astonished, Liam witnessed all the logs being effortlessly sliced. The device also didn't detect any cheating. Curious about Yasushi's method. Liam inquired about how he managed to cut them all. Yasushi cryptically replied that Liam would find the answer through learning from him. Intrigued by Yasushi's skill, Liam accepted the offer to be trained. As Liam examined the cut logs, Yasushi took pleasure in the ease with which he had fooled Liam. In reality, Yasushi was merely an amateur swordsman and a swindler. He intended to extract as much money as possible, and he was surprised that he hadn't been caught yet. Being a street hustler, he used sleight-of-hand tricks. Taking advantage of the logs already being cut. He had anticipated being exposed by Amaji's device and planned to lie his way out, pretending to have used magic. However, he was relieved to discover that the trickery detection device was faulty. The detection device is only capable of detecting advanced tricks, but not primary tricks like sleight of hand. With Liam's training underway, Yasushi delighted in witnessing his rapid progress. He pondered what he should teach Liam next while browsing online videos. Despite hearing negative rumors about the Banfield house, Yasushi found Liam living a relatively modest life and displaying genuine dedication. Wondering why Liam was so determined to become strong when he could rely on subordinates for protection. Yasushi couldn't fathom the motivation behind Liam's ambition. Although Liam's life seemed content, Yasushi sensed the need for caution, knowing that Amaji kept a watchful eye on him. Discovering that the nobles had shifted their debts and responsibilities onto the children. Yasushi understood that his own situation was not unique. However, perceiving Liam as a serious individual due to his hard work, Yasushi feared that exposure could lead to a disastrous outcome. After some time, the new mansion was completed. Boasting a simpler and more spacious design, compared to its predecessor. While working at his office, Amaji reminded Liam that it was time to enter the capsule once again, a process that would take half a year. The capsule contained a vast amount of knowledge, which would require more than a decade to fully absorb. Eager to acquire as much knowledge as possible before reaching adulthood, Liam entrusted the management of the territory to Amaji. However, she appeared preoccupied, contemplating a file. Concerned, Liam inquired about the issue, prompting Amaji to show him the file. He requested that she bring in the person who had submitted it. A pompous man bedecked in jewels entered the room, claiming that the mentioned costs were necessary for carrying out his duties. Amaji reported that he had been involved in embezzlement, hindering the territory's development. Rather than being remorseful, the man had the audacity to smile in front of Liam. Amaji revealed his additional crimes of bribery and embezzlement, 
prompting Liam to inquire about further transgressions. The man asserted that dolls, like Amiji, could never comprehend the necessity of his actions, likening his crimes to grease lubricating the engine of progress. Liam questioned whether it brought him joy to frame his comrades for his own mistakes, and as the man struggled to formulate a response, Liam drew his sword. Ignoring Amiji's plea, he repeated the question, asking if it was gratifying to make others suffer for personal blunders. Enraged, the man angrily claimed that Liam's comfortable life was a result of his actions. In a moment reminiscent of his past experiences with his former boss, Liam swiftly killed the man. Amaji promptly sprayed a liquid that quickly cleaned the blood, ensuring Liam's safety. As she asked if he was all right, Liam snapped out of his rage, realizing the enormity of what he had done. He questioned how he could speak so boldly when he had been leeching off of someone like the deceased man. Determined to eradicate corruption, Liam instructed Amaji to identify all officials involved in such activities so that he could administer justice. Amaji attempted to calm him, urging him to release the sword. The shock of his past life experiences and the act of taking another's life left Liam furious, only subsiding when Amaji called out to him. She explained that there were many corrupt officials, and executing all of them would create further complications. Instead, she proposed acquiring surveillance AI, which might not possess her advanced capabilities, but would assist in monitoring the situation. Liam approved the plan to purchase 30 AIs, dismissing concerns about unpleasant rumors regarding his reliance on AI. He declared his trust in Amaji, emphasizing that he valued her more than any human. With preparations set in motion, Liam desired a realm free from anyone who would oppose him. Outside the territory, people in the bar engaged in discussions about the Lord executing corrupt officials. One individual had received this information from a friend working as a cleaner in Liam's residence. They also learned about the extension of compulsory education from three to six years, realizing that construction workers would be needed in the near future. Despite the controversial nature of Liam's actions, people agreed that his approach displayed a sense of justice, causing a stir among the nobles. They considered whether this signified a new era or merely an illusion, yet regardless, they acknowledged Liam's power and wondered what he would do next. Once the corrupt officials were purged from his territory, the new workers replaced them. The newly recruited mansion workers gathered as Brian briefed them on their duties. Inquisitive, one of the female servants asked about their obligations to Liam during the night. Brian reassured her. Explaining that Liam was young and had no need for such concerns, as Amaji took care of most of his needs. Astonished, another servant remarked on the doll always by Liam's side. Brian sternly rebuked him, making it clear that such behavior would no longer be tolerated. While Amaji was indeed capable, her presence risked tarnishing Liam's reputation as an AI. Yet, Liam's unwavering trust in her made them inseparable. He relied on her with childlike dependence, a reflection of his parents' abandonment in raising him. Brian lamented why Cliff hadn't raised Liam properly. He warned the servants never to disrespect Amaji, as he couldn't guarantee protection from Liam's wrath. With Liam as their head, the Banfield house would be able to reclaim its former glory once again. Two decades later, Liam now 30 years old, dedicated himself to swordsmanship, skillfully cleaving through logs around him. Frustrated by his inability to slice through all three logs and his rough execution, he questioned his talent. Liam warmly greeted his master, Yasushi, expressing his disappointment in his own skills. Yasushi consoled him, explaining that the path of the sword was arduous and devoid of rewards, yet praised Liam for his remarkable improvement over the past 20 years. Lost in memories of his early training, Liam recalled his master teaching him that swordsmanship relied on martial power and the utilization of magic. He applied a layer of magic to extend his sword's reach. Yasushi acknowledged the truth in Liam's efforts, but noted that he lacked the final piece. Curious, Liam inquired about this missing element, to which Yasushi advised him to delve deeper into basics of the magics for at least ten years to have a strong foundation. 
as magic alone couldn't shield one from the perils of futuristic weaponry, paled in comparison to the efficiency of carrying a gun. Not all magic was useless, with healing and auxiliary magic proving successful. However, magic was crucial in piloting and maneuvering humanoid weapons. Yasushi urged Liam to grasp the basics of magic, as his current training was insufficient. Liam eagerly accepted his master's advice, willing to dedicate a decade to mastering the fundamentals. As a lord, focusing solely on martial arts was ill-advised, and Yasushi inquired about Liam's progress in developing his territory. Liam shared his rapid progress in reorganizing the military and constructing skyscrapers with ease, questioning why his parents hadn't done the same during their reign. Deep in thought, Liam's master instructed him to demonstrate the basics he had learned. Challenging him to do so with his eyes, closed to increase the difficulty. He also added weights to the sword, commanding Liam to swing it until it felt as light as a branch. Liam reveled in the sensation, reminiscent of manga adventures. With Liam's eyes shut, Yasushi ensured they were alone. Perturbed by Liam's ability to transform fake swordplay into tangible skill. While Yasushi recognized Liam's genius, he couldn't help but worry about his own fate, considering Liam's ruthless actions against corrupt officials. Determined to escape, Yasushi planned to save money while conceiving an exit strategy. Several years later, Liam effortlessly performed his training blindfolded, prompting Yasushi to challenge him further, urging him to develop extraordinary sight as he still had room for growth. Yasushi decided to increase the weight of the swords, astonished by Liam's relentless progress. He went to the storehouse to find some valuable stuff so he could make money. Yasushi stumbled upon a humanoid figure, sparking a new idea. He called upon Amiji and requested her assistance in making it operational for Liam's training. Amiji questioned the use of an outdated model, suggesting they purchase a new one instead. However, Yasushi insisted on utilizing the older version. Citing its sturdiness and the valuable time it would afford Liam to master the controls of the latest model within a few years. Despite Amiji's attempts to dissuade him, Yasushi grew frustrated, adamantly declaring that this was the best method for Liam's skill development. He believed that modern society relied excessively on automated functions. Yasushi instructed Amiji to prepare the humanoid which was named as Avid and departed. Amiji wondered if Yasushi was really a swordmaster as his records were too clean as if they were erased by someone. Acknowledging Liam's remarkable growth, she resolved to fulfill the order. The mobile knight, manufactured by the Empire Factory, required substantial funds, but Amiji remained committed to protecting her master and asked Avid to lend her help to do that. The following day, Liam recognized Amiji's presence solely by her footsteps. Concerned for his safety, Amiji cautioned him against walking blindfolded, but Liam dismissed it as part of his training. Eager to learn about the progress of the mobile night she was preparing, Liam inquired. Amiji expressed her frustration, revealing that Yasushi had insisted on using an older model instead of purchasing a new one. Liam trusted his master's judgment and resumed his training. Meanwhile, at a local bar, a satisfied customer praised the owner's thriving business and his own successful endeavors. Both wondered at the rapid transformations occurring around them. The owner reminisced about the golden era 500 years ago, during his grandfather's time. Contemplating the current lord's silence over the past two decades. Rumors circulated that the new lord held a fondness for dolls, an unusual trait for nobles. However, as long as he continued his remarkable work, the townsfolk were content to overlook his peculiarities. As the repairs on the mobile night concluded, Liam marveled at its appearance. Nias Carlin, the technology officer from the Seventh Weapon Factory, remarked on the challenges they faced during its development. Having worked on it personally, they felt a sense of nostalgia. Nias inquired whether it was acceptable for the mobile knight to lack assist functions, akin to manual or automatic transmission in a car. Yasushi affirmed Liam's preference, expressing interest in hearing the craft's details directly. Attempting to make advances toward Nias, Yasushi was met with her evasive maneuvers. 
she stated that the craft operated solely on manual controls, deeming an explanation unnecessary since Liam would be the one piloting it. Liam contemplated whether he should order Nias to spend time with his master. But he dismissed the idea as unnecessary, believing that Yasushi was merely playing around and that Nias would not be safe if he were serious. He believed Yasushi was an honorable person. Determined, Liam entered the cockpit, accompanied by Nias. The interior of the cockpit had been enchanted with space magic, making it spacious enough for Liam's comfort. Nias proceeded to discuss the mobile night specifications. As Liam settled into the seat, he found it remarkably comfortable, molding around his body. He appreciated its sleek black appearance of black color as most of the men prefer the same style. It was customary for nobles to decorate their mobile knights in a flashy manner as a symbol of their wealth and power. Nias explained that most nobles prioritized external aesthetics. But Liam's focus on the interior was unique. The generous budget allocated to the project allowed for indulgence in the craftsmanship. When Liam activated the engine, the mobile knight recognized him as its rightful owner, refusing to respond to anyone else's commands. However, when he attempted to maneuver the craft, it crashed onto the ground. Nias clarified that the lack of a self-balancing assist function made control challenging. To achieve mastery, Liam needed to develop the ability to control the craft as if it were an extension of his own body. Liam wondered if his pursuit of piloting could lead him to become a first-rate pilot. Nias clarified that if he could move it around that means he already became a first-rate pilot. Nias instructed him about the specifications. Liam gradually transferred his magic to the machine using his imagination. He successfully managed to make it stand up. Astonished, Nias observed Liam successfully maneuvering the mobile knight on his first attempt. Impressed by Liam's natural aptitude for control, Nias proceeded to explain additional features of the craft. As Nias concluded her explanation, Liam found himself captivated by her bosom. He pressed those suddenly leaving Nias surprised. Attempting to brush it off as unintentional, he suggested taking a break. Outside, Brian watched with tears in his eyes as Liam operated Alistair's old mobile night. Observing the craft's unusual movements, Brian struggled to bear witness to its improper use. He was concerned about the lack of communication. Yasushi on the other hand wondered how Nias's breasts felt and cursed Liam. Both Amaji and Brian questioned whether such behavior aligned with the conduct expected of a swordmaster. Nias departed after spending three months explaining the details of the mobile night. Yasushi resolved to obtain her contact information in the future, also harboring a desire to avenge Liam's accidental strike. Determined to push Liam harder and break his pride, he initiated rigorous training at the mansion over the next few days. Brian worried about Liam's intense training regimen, but Liam dismissed his concerns, believing that the master must have considered it thoroughly. Yasushi surrounded Liam with numerous devices that launched balls at him, demanding that he handle them and criticizing his performance. Questioning how he could become a first-rate swordsman with such ineptitude. Yasushi urged Liam to rely on his mind's eye and the sixth and seventh senses, which even he didn't know. Liam initially believed it was impossible with just a wooden sword. However he pondered about it for some time and succeeded in deflecting it which shocked Yasushi more. However, to his surprise, Liam succeeded in deploying an imaginary protective barrier, further puzzling Yasushi. Given that the Issen style combined magic and swordsmanship, Liam fused the two to deflect all the balls, inadvertently causing one to strike Yasushi in the mouth. Witnessing Liam's growth, Yasushi decided to depart, claiming he had imparted almost all of his knowledge and needed to focus on his personal training to attain the secret technique. When Liam proposed opening a dojo for Yasushi in his territory, Yasushi declined, stating that he was in the midst of his own journey. Liam requested at least an assessment of his swordsmanship, which Yasushi agreed to provide before taking his leave. After some time had passed, the guide embarked on a search for Liam, amazed at the rapid development of the territory. Curiosity drove him to discover what Liam had learned from the conman. 
To his astonishment, Liam effortlessly severed several logs with his sword, which were out of reach. Amaji and Brian praised his skill, but Liam remained unsatisfied with his current level as it still lacks against his master's skills. The guide was shocked to see Liam's skills and searched for Yasushi's whereabouts. Yasushi was engrossed in conversation with a girl, regaling her with the tale of his disciple who surpassed him in a mere decade, becoming a first-rate swordsman while he remained a third-rate. Liam's ability to cut through steel without drawing his sword seemed unfathomable. The guide's anger grew. Reading Liam's thoughts where he expressed his luck in having such a master, he felt deceived yet acknowledged the guide's remarkable insight in assigning him such a mentor. Liam's gratitude left a bitter taste in the guide's mouth, sparking thoughts of how to deal with him. Observing Liam's daily routine, the guide pondered on ways to bring misfortune upon him, confident in his ability to end Liam's reign. However, Liam only had a doll and an old butler by his side, and despite his expectations, Liam worked diligently. Time passed as the guide watched over Liam. Liam realized it was the right choice to develop the territory, as it now gave him a chance to raise tax and oppress his people and live his life as an evil lord. The guide felt a kinship with Liam, raising something only to knock it down. He eagerly awaited future developments. Upon hearing Liam's thoughts about starting a harem by forcefully gathering beautiful girls, the guide found amusement in the idea. He devised a scenario where these women, brought against their will, would betray Liam and even cuckled him when he fell in love with some women like the past. The guide believed Liam would suffer greatly. Just then, Amaji entered and reported that the Empire proposed recruiting reserve soldiers and military personnel from the Empire while they had acquired and used materials. Liam initially thought they would be useless. But Amaji insisted they were skilled, having graduated from the Empire Military Academy with ample experience. Liam decided to accept them. Upon hearing this, the guide resolved to gather serious and honest soldiers who wouldn't tolerate an evil lord, seeking to bring an end to Liam through their efforts. With his plans in motion, the guide prepared to depart, contemplating whether he was working too much. The overwhelming sense of gratitude from Liam disgusted him, so he decided to reside elsewhere temporarily. Looking forward to Liam entertaining him on his next visit before leaving the premises. As time passed, Liam reached the age of 40 but appeared as youthful as ever. Amaji informed him of Nia's arrival from the 7th Weapon Factory. Tasked with inspecting the state of the mobile knight named Avid. Liam questioned if that was her sole purpose. Amaji believed she came to sell their factory's goods, as they were financially stable now. Liam wondered why they didn't sell to the Imperial family or others. Amaji explained that the seventh factory's designs were lacking compared to others, making them a mediocre choice. Despite the presence of several factories, the third factory remained popular in the Empire due to its quality and design. Intrigued by Nia's visit, Liam decided to hear what she had to say. Nias greeted Liam in a seductive manner, while Amaji quietly noted that her attire went against imperial regulations. Liam cut to the chase, prompting Nias to request his purchase of battleships or weapons from the Seventh Factory. She described the battleship's functions where Amaji mentioned their cost, which equaled three times the price of other factories' battleships, excluding the Empire's taxes. Nias emphasized the specifications, leading Liam to question why they didn't sell their ships to the Empire. Nias revealed that they had failed the Empire's inspections. Although the Seventh Factory's performance was slightly superior in terms of performance ratio, people preferred stylish ships over lackluster ones. Nias pleaded for Liam to buy the ships, but he dismissed her. Continuing his conversation with Amaji regarding ordering from the Third Factory, Nias realized they were in a difficult situation. Liam criticized the horrible design of their battleships, highlighting their productivity cost and maneuverability as their only redeeming qualities. Nias, desperate to change his mind, removed her coat and attempted to seduce him. However, Liam's aversion to flashy underwear, reminiscent of his ex-wife, made him reject her advances. He expressed the pain he felt at her actions. 
Neos accused him of ogling at her breasts, previously. But Liam insisted he didn't feel that way anymore. In a last-ditch effort, she kneeled before him, begging him to purchase the ships. Reluctantly, Liam agreed, and Amaji saw the long TERM potential. They settled on buying 300 ships with modified interiors. Neos tried to avoid design modifications, but Liam attributed their failed inspections to the lackluster designs, leaving Neos disheartened. Meanwhile, Brian happily strolled through the corridor, delighted by the increased number of guests. He spotted Neos boasting to her colleague about how she successfully sold 300 ships. Her colleague found it hard to believe, but Neos assured him that Liam was smitten with her, quickly changing his opinion. Her colleague still found it hard to believe. He asked her to marry him which she declined, asserting that they should be proud of her accomplishment. Overhearing their conversation, Brian grew concerned about Liam's future, fearing he had fallen into a honey trap set by Neos. Liam had a meeting scheduled with Thomas Henfry, the exclusive merchant for the Banfield house. Thomas presented a suitcase filled with gold when Liam inquired about the acquisition of yellow sweets. Liam playfully referred to him as Ekagoya, an evil merchant. Without Thomas understanding the meaning, Thomas requested to be called the Henry Chamber of Commerce, seeking help from Liam. He needed a hundred battleships to navigate through treacherous sectors. Liam questioned the true danger of Thomas's destination. To which Thomas explained that the numerous space pirates along the route posed a greater threat. Liam glanced at Amaji, who confirmed their ability to gather a hundred vessels. He requested Thomas to bring more yellow sweets next time, along with profits. Liam ordered the immediate departure of the ships. On the ship, Thomas's subordinates marveled at the development of the Banfield territory under such a young lord's leadership. They considered Liam to be truly benevolent. However, they couldn't comprehend why he specifically desired gold when it wasn't a scarce resource, even within his territory. Thomas himself pondered this question. He had brought mithril, jewels, and other precious resources, but Liam's genuine delight was evident when he saw the gold. They found Liam to be exceedingly generous. Learning that the taxes were invested back into the territory only reinforced their belief that he was not a typical noble. They wondered how far the territory could have developed if not for the substantial Banfield debt. Determined to succeed in this trade, Thomas aimed to fulfill his role as the Banfield House's exclusive merchant. In Liam's office, he proudly displayed the gold to Brian, admitting he had accepted a bribe, and sought Amaji's opinion. They questioned Liam's obsession with gold, reminding him of the higher value of mithril and other resources. Liam acknowledged their worth but argued that adorning oneself with them was impractical. Amaji mentioned the popularity of mithril rings among ladies, but Liam didn't find them as precious since they were multipurpose metals whereas gold was primarily used in jewelry. Liam instructed Brian to process the gold, intending to use it as currency. Though it wasn't Brian's responsibility, he complied with Liam's order. After Brian left, Liam still marveled at the development of his territory, which was once considered the Bunas, but had improved since his inheritance. He also found the attire of the people inadequate in terms of design. Liam decided to invest in aesthetic businesses and planned to call entertainers to improve sales. Despite Amaji's persuasion against it, Liam insisted on hiring entertainers. However, the entertainers who arrived were not what he had in mind. He also encountered a group of women with oversized breasts, where their planet emphasized a woman's value based on breast size. Displeased with the situation, Liam immediately cancelled all the plans. The guide, who observed these events, grew furious. Despite claiming to be an evil lord, Liam never laid a hand on women or indulged in debauchery, and to make matters worse, he was perceived as a benevolent lord by everyone. Liam's gratitude caused the guide physical discomfort, including nausea, dizziness, ulcers, and headaches. Gratitude was the most dangerous poison for an evil being. Realizing his ideas were futile, the guide decided to destroy the planet Liam developed from a distance where his gratitude couldn't reach. 
He sought out the space pirates, who had ample free time, and spotted Goes, the pirate captain known as the Pirate King, and he manipulated his thoughts. Goes reveled in destroying planets and pillaging them. When one of his subordinates suggested sparing the people, Go swiftly crushed the person's head, dismissing any objections. Wiping his hands with a towel, he found the raid too easy this time, with their haul being quite substantial. He inquired about his favorite girl, who was chained in a room. She was the first one to retain her sanity after becoming the captain's plaything. Goes decided to dispose of her since he had already exhausted her entertainment value and sought a new toy as her replacement. As Goes played with a cube, his subordinates asked about their next target. Goes set his sights on the recently rumored brat, Banfield, who was hailed as a benevolent lord. Given Liam's efforts in developing his territory, Goes desired to destroy it, brandishing the box in his hand. Targeting someone upright and challenging excited Goes, who wanted to witness their downfall. The guide manipulated Goes' thoughts, leading him to target Liam and preparing to unleash hell upon him. Like and subscribe to see whether Liam was able to defeat the Pirate King and escape this predicament and also to know about his future endeavors.